The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Do you believe in ghosts? Oh, not necessarily the old-fashioned kind, dragging clanking chains behind them, the fetid odor of the grave, voicing the ghastly groans of souls in torment, or threatening some terrible supernatural justice that they intend to wield. I'm thinking of gentler ghosts who have your interest in mind, not your destruction. No consciousness yet, Kathy. No. How's the scope, nurse? Key waves are almost flat. What happened, Bruce? Potassium imbalance. She must have lost too much. Can we save her? We damn well better. Stephen Champion signed his death warrant for this child. She's got to come through. Stephen had every reason for living. He's got to have a decent one for dying. <laughs> mystery drama, Angel of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Marion Seldes and Michael Wager. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. the present, and of the past, and in a couple of ways, of the future as well. It is also a story of life and death, death both violent and accidental, and death that is natural and supernatural. It is a haunting story in the actual and also the figurative sense. It is a story of hope deferred and renewed. And it begins with a wildly emotional threat. I could kill you, Frank. Dee Dee, <laughs> darling, for Pete's sake, get hold of yourself. How could you dare? Everything. Everything I have to remember him by and cherish him by. You throw it out like discarded rubbish. <laughs> do you think it didn't tear my heart out to do it, too? I don't what it did to you. All I know is what it did to me. You, you deliberately buried every memory I have of my son. Your son? Our son. If after what you've done can make you pretend he meant as much to you. I resent that. Well, I resent that you constitute yourself God or an amateur psychiatrist, whatever you think you are, to strip his room bare of all my memories. Dorothy. <laughs> Dorothy, we lost our boy. I was involved, too, just as much as you. But to continue to keep Jimmy's room as a sort of shrine, that was sick. To moon over the first sleeping animals we gave him, the bat and glove, I was sentimental idiot enough to give him too soon. To keep it all intact like little boy Blue's room as if he was coming back, that's what was destroying us. And destroying you. He was my only one. He's gone. He's but the gone. doctors the all doctors, say... The doctors, <laughs> With your background, you should thank them. All right, once they saved my life. What could they do for our Jimmy? There's a world of difference between being totaled in a crest like Jimmy was and being rescued by medical science. Fifteen years ago, you'd have been just as dead if it wasn't what for... What a terrible thing to say. I'm trying to bring you to your senses. Good Lord, Dorothy, do you think I can stand by and see our marriage fall apart? Over a tragedy that should have and did shake us both to bedrock, but that we have to overcome. I can't, Frank. Darling, Dorothy, 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 please, listen to me. We've lost Jimmy. He's gone. All I wanted to do was to clear him out of your mind because we can have other kids no, and... No, no. There aren't any substitutes. You can't 
try to make life a simple little exchange like that. A substitute won't bring Jimmy back. Right. <laughs> so why do you think I gave everything away of his... changed that... that unhealthy alter to a son we both once had into just another room in the house? I want you to forget him. I'll never forget him. Well, I, I, I didn't mean it quite that way. You don't understand. You're right, Frank. We don't understand each other any longer. I feel my life is over. You don't. So make the most of what you have left. Where are you going? Away. Out of it. A moment ago, I said a silly thing. I wanted to kill you. <laughs> what I really should have said is I want to kill myself. Oh, I wish I had the courage. <laughs> because all I want to be is dead. <laughs> like my son. Dorothy! Dorothy! Where are you going? Apart, and I don't know what could pace me back together. I don't even know what I'm doing in the car. Hurtling through the night too fast for this mountain road. Why should I want to kill myself? When I have a husband who's loving and kind, even if he doesn't understand, I... I can't get over Jimmy's death. How could I blame Frank? And yet... Take all the mementos of my child away and give them to... What am I thinking? I'm, I'm mad. But, but face it, anyone who doesn't want to live anymore... Which, but... aside from being an insult to me, is a silly thing to think at 26 years of age. Who are you? I'm not quite sure anymore. Once I thought I knew. Now I don't. How did you get in the car? Now, that wasn't my problem. When I'm always with you, whether you see me or not. I don't understand. In a way, you... You seem like someone I might have known, but I don't actually recognize you. And still, I'm sure we must have met. Well, we did meet. But very briefly, a long time ago. Yes, and and I feel I owe you something. No, I don't. It was just a fair exchange, your life for mine. And between us, I don't think mine could have been saved. I'm puzzled. I, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> so many things that puzzle you, aren't there? Yeah, I, I must be seeing things, thinking things. I am alone in this car. There's nobody else but me. Well, that could be right. What? If you don't remember me, I guess I don't exist. You mean you're a ghost? Or something that haunts you. Well, why would you haunt me? Because you called. I called? Yes. Something to do with your conscience, I might imagine. My conscience? Well, I think it's troubling you. This is all crazy. Who are you? You still don't remember? I can't... Something I... I must be mad talking to myself. You can't be here. There was nobody but me in the car when I got in. What are you doing here? Where are you from? From inside your mind, buried deep in the layers of memory. What am I here for? To save you from yourself. Well, what does that mean? You blame your husband for your son's death? Yes. Oh, 
No. I... You see, the thing that matters, the only thing that matters, is when Jimmy was lost, we lost each other. I'll never find my way back to Frank, to what we had. Jimmy stands in the way. He always will. And so you're running away into the night. To do what? Oh, I don't know. To get away from it. I, I can't stand that empty room. <laughs> and an empty heart. <laughs> you know you can't fill either of them up by running away. I know. I know. You have some other idea? Did you want to kill yourself? No. Oh. No, I, I don't believe in that. Huh? Are you sure? Look at your knuckles. Dead white because your hands are clenched so tightly on the wheel. Ah, look at your right foot. Jamming the accelerator to the floor. Look in your heart. Consciously or subconsciously, didn't you have something like this in mind? <laughs> Nothing yet. I wanted to give you a glimpse of the future, and I did. You mean I'm going to crash? I mean, you could if you don't turn back. I can't. I can't. There's nothing for me the way I turn. I've lost it all. I just don't want to live. Well, I don't think that's quite fair to me. To you? What claim do you have on me? Maybe I'd better light up the past for you. Open your memory and tell you why I have... Oh, not a claim, but shall we say a vested interest in you. Sixteen, perhaps seventeen years ago, you were a little girl of ten with a whole life ahead of you. And I was quite an old man of... Oh, early in my seventies with most of my life behind me. I never married Dorothy and I never had a child. The nearest thing was a young man who was one of my medical students and who in the year that I'm talking about was a pioneer in a process I helped to develop to save lives. Something taken for granted today but in the late 50s, so new and so untried that it tied up five doctors who volunteered time for eight to ten hours at the stretch. I'll tell you about that later. That medical student I mentioned had just been made chief of surgical services of the Westfield Community Hospital here. And I was flying up to be at his wedding, to stand in loco parentis since Bruce's father was dead. When suddenly the old man with the size decided to take a swipe at me. Good morning, Dr. Johnson. You're on page. I heard it. Thank you, nurse. I'm on my way to Dr. Harding's now. You're a lucky girl. Don't I know it. Three days till the wedding. I didn't mean that. I meant you're the only one in this hospital can answer that summons without taking a deep breath. <laughs> you think he's all that tough? He runs a tight ship. You? Maybe he treats with kid gloves. Don't you ever believe it. When our new chief of surgery puts me on page, he wants the physician, not the fiancé. I'd better straighten up and fly, right? Come. Good morning, Dr. Johnson. Morning, Dr. Harding. <laughs> Bruce. Kathy, darling. Mm, every doctor's day should begin like this. I wish mine had begun as well. What is it? No wedding shopping this afternoon. We're both needed on the artificial kidney. I'm just calling the team together now. Who's the patient? One of our wedding guests. Outside of my mother, the most important one on my side of the aisle. Oh, not your old teacher, not... Stephen Champion. The top biologist in this country, maybe in the world. They just called me from the airport. He's on the way by ambulance. Thank God we're one of the first hospitals in the country to have the machine. Renal failure? Possibly terminal. Certainly without the support we can offer. Maybe it isn't that serious. Let's not kid ourselves, Kathy. 
I talked to Steve briefly. Damn the luck. One of the great men of our century, teacher, scientist, Nobel Prize winner, pioneer in every kind of perfusion pump, including the kidney machine he's coming here to use. And the nearest thing to a father I've ever known. Oh, don't sound so hopeless, darling. Face it, Kathy, he's not young. But, well, the way things go today, there's always hope. Stephen's given his whole life to medicine. The least we can do is try to save what's left of it for him. And so we have turned back from a story of the present for one in the not-too-distant past and have learned who that quiet, understanding ghost that haunts and tries to comfort Dorothy Maitland is or was. But how was his fate tied in with hers? When did he die and how? And why his concern? I shall return shortly with Act Two. It is incredible to think that hemodialysis, or the artificial kidney, is a standard piece of supportive equipment available in any hospital today. In addition, it is small and portable. Medicine marches with such giant strides. Less than 20 years ago, hemodialysis was a new and only hope to preserve the patient's life. Transplants were still a thing of the future. Atkins, what's this note about little Dee Dee Blake being scheduled for surgery? Dr. Labar's orders, Dr. Johnson. She had a reverse. When? During the night. Why wasn't I notified immediately? Well, the chief resident knows you're going to be married next week, and since Dr. Labar is standby on the The case, resident stuck his neck out. I'll be glad to lop it off for him later. My patients get my service. I'll have time to check Dee Dee before I go to the kidney room. I want to examine her myself. Will you see that she's prepped while I change? Oh, and notify Central where I'll be in case Dr. Harding needs me. And put Mr. Champion over there, orderly. Uh, brought me straight to the monster, huh, Bruce? The stop along the way, Steve. I examined you in the treatment room, ran off some tests. Oh, did you now? I don't remember that. I must be worse off than I thought. Am I? Just routine. I have to establish the balance of chemicals for the bath. And... Coming to the point, I think you know that I'm a hard man to con. I do. We owe each other the truth, don't we, Bruce? Yes, Steve. But you know it as well as I do. Yeah. Uh, would have liked to see you married and drunk some of your champagne. But I have no other complaints. It's been a long road and there has to be an end sometime. Not yet. Not by a long shot. I wonder. The artificial kidney saves lives every day. I helped to build it for that. Steve, ten hours on it and your own kidneys will be strong and healthy enough to fight the uremic infection. I'm old, son. And I'm very, very tired. Why continue the fight? There's no one to battle for, no one of my own to mourn me. That's simply not true. No wife, no child, no issue. When I cease to function, then I am gone. Like a snowflake melted on a river. Not for me. You'll never be gone. Or a whole generation of people whose lifespan has been lengthened by your discoveries. Besides, you yourself have left us the means to prolong yours and the team of doctors I've assembled here to make sure it is prolonged. Is this poor old carcass really worth all that trouble? In my book it is. Not only for this machine alone, but all the others you've worked on. The breakthroughs you've made. Who in the world is more worth it? <laughs> Make me 
this sound like an entry in who's who? Dry words in a dusty book. My epitaph. What I do or achieve in my lifetime will be a drop in the bucket next to what Stephen Champion has contributed. We need you for the next breakthrough. <laughs> You're a better con man than I gave you credit for. Ah, uh, eh? Bring on your cannula. Let's make a fight for it. That's the attitude. I'll go scrub to make the cut down. You know what? Excuse me. Kidney room, Dr. Harding speaking. This room is supposed to be zeroed out. Bruce, it's Kathy. Kathy, where the Sam Hill are you? We're all ready to go. You're keeping us waiting. I'm sorry, darling. I may have to hold up things a little longer. What does that mean? I'm up in Dainty Blake's room. Who? Oh, your favorite little patient, 513. Something's wrong. I need you up here, Bruce. Are you out of your mind? You know the one place I needed is right here. What is it? What I was afraid of started last night. Dr. Labar scheduled her for ops this morning. So? What do you want me to do about it? Even though it's technically my case, he outranks me. I want you to countermand that order. Why? Because I think she's in no condition to stand surgery. I'm convinced I know what she needs. And that's a decision you're the only one who can make. Oh, Kathy, for Pete's sake, let's not start our life together with you taking advantage of the fact that I... Dr. Harding, this is Dr. Johnson talking to you, and this is an emergency. All right, it had better be. I'll be right up there to see for myself. Steve, small crisis. Give me five minutes. Well, uh, I've lived for 73 years, Bruce. I guess I can hang on for five more minutes. <laughs> And I don't like doctors anymore. Even Dr. Johnson? Oh, not her. We're forever friends. We're also perennial pals, solid sidekicks, and bosom buddies. It's a game. You have to be illiterate to play it. That's with an A, not an I. Of course. If you were illiterate, you couldn't play. Alliterate means the first letters of both words are the same. Or any number. Like in Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Or a big black bug bit a big brown bear. That's pretty good for a man, Doctor. And you're pretty smart for a ten-year-old. Well, Dr. Johnson taught me. Old Dr. Labar never could. Anyway, he has a mustache. <laughs> I'm glad Dr. Johnson doesn't. <laughs> But you know, Dr. LeBarn is a very good doctor. I don't think so. He wants to operate on me again. He told you that? Just last night. He said I had one bad old kidney that was poisoning the other one. So he'd have to cut the naughty one out. He talks down. You know. But you won't let him, will you? Talk down. No, take it out. We'll try not to, Dee Dee. Do you... Mind if I ask Dr. Johnson some questions? Can I listen? If you want. But I bet you won't understand. What's the blood urea nitrogen in the last five days? Wednesday, 94. Thursday? 115. Friday, 138. Saturday? Same, but today... 225. What's the phosphorus count? 7.5. Renal acidosis. <sighs> Low calcium. Hmm? 6.8. Creatinine. 5.4. You don't sound like doctors. Oh? What do we sound like? Quarterbacks. Learning plays. I help my brother with his playbook. He's one. A doctor? No, a quarterback. He's only 15. I don't care. I'm so... so tired. Nurse, get her back on Ivy. Come over here, Kathy. What do you think, Bruce? I think Labar was right. No question one kidney is seriously infected. I can tell that even from palpation. There's obvious bilateral involvement, not only indicated manually, but from the output. So you agree to the operation? Absolutely not. She's in no condition to take it. Then you know what the answer is. Hemodialysis. That's why I called you up here. After Stephen Champion... It could be too late. She could recover spontaneously. Dee Dee is young. It's her youth that concerns me. She's just a little girl with her whole life ahead of her. But Stephen Champion... 
Oh, darling, I know how much he means to you. What a terrible thing I have to say. But which is the most deserved? You cannot ask me to put Steve's life on the line. Yes, nurse, what is it? It's Dee Dee. She's gone into coma. I'll handle this, Kathy. Check Mr. Champion downstairs. I'll be with you the first moment I can. You want me to set up the kidney machine for Dee Dee instead? I don't know. How can I ask a man like Stephen Champion to risk giving up his life? Me, of all people. How can you ask a child to give up her right to it? Oh, my darling, why must I be the one to ask you to make such a decision? <laughs> Just a little oxygen, Mr. Champion. Nothing to be afraid of. Uh, I don't need it. Uh, at my age, there's nothing left to be afraid of. Uh, or everything. Uh, uh, who are you? I'm Dr. Johnson. Uh, no, you're not. You're Kathy. Sorry I held things up. It's all right. Now, you're the girl Bruce Harding's going to marry. Guilty as charged. Oh, no, no, no. Life is fully young. And I wish you all its wonder. Bruce will be right down. It's my fault he's delayed. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not. It gives me a chance to talk to you a moment. Uh, just tell me about this little patient of yours. Why do you want to talk about Dee Dee Blake? Well, I have my reasons. A female? Most definitely. Attractive? Adorable. Uh, Big, dark, haunting eyes. A complete femme fatale. She's ten years old. Uh, what's the matter with her? Well, it should have been just a simple appendicitis, but it perforated. Peritonitis? Yes. Uh, I begin to see a pattern. Probable sulfur reaction, huh? That's right. The threat of renal failure. Too late for surgical procedure. How could you know all this? Well, I heard enough from this end when you were talking to Bruce to make an educated guess. It poses quite a problem, doesn't it? I don't follow you. Of course you do. She needs hemodialysis on an emergency basis, as I do. One kidney machine to serve two emergencies. Which do you save first, huh? huh? Ten-year-old girl with the dark, haunting eyes who might have the reserves of strength in her own young vitals to recover? Or uh, a weak old man with possibly great contributions left to make to society but who stands a good chance of not making it, even with supportive measures. No time to convene the death committee. This one's on Bruce alone. It's one heck of a hot potato you handed your husband to be, isn't it, Kathy? I wonder what he'll do. <laughs> still piercing under the shaggy brows in spite of his weakness. Kathy is held immobilized, aware now that her fondness for her own patient has forced an unbearable choice on the man she loves. I'll return shortly with Act Three. Kathy, her breath still caught in her throat, stares fixedly at the shrewd old man who has stated the dilemma Bruce faces. Her brain fumbles to think what she would do in his position. And on a personal and selfish level, while wondering how Bruce will react, she cannot help a twinge of fear at what his decision will do to their personal relationship, whichever way it goes. Tell me about your patient, Kathy. Tell me about this Dee Dee, whatever her name is. 
Is she intelligent? I think so. Uh Uh-huh. And what contributions do you think she can make to society at large? (laughs) It's a little too early to tell. Huh? Is it? Does she have good pelvic construction? Will she bear healthy children? I'm sure she will someday. So, that's Stevie. Now let's have a look at Stephen Champion. Do you know what I'm working on, or was, before I was hospitalized? No, I don't. In a complex field, the collagens. But I won't explain, except to say that the breakthrough I believe I am near could mean all the difference to thousands, to countless lives. Well, I'd like to be a part of that. I don't blame you. Well, not so much for myself, but... If it doesn't sound too stuffy for humanity. I knew that's what you meant. There's also the thought that for faithful service, a man should be entitled to ask for a reward. Isn't he? Yes. Particularly when the reward is the use of something he pioneered and developed. There's no question. I And totally on the personal level... I wanted to be at your wedding more than anything else I can think of. Because Bruce Harding is the closest thing to a child I ever... I I think you've proved your point, though, Mr. Champion. Have I? Ah, well, there you are at last, Bruce. You ready to start? Stephen, I... Well, come on, spit it out. You... No, the artificial kidney can be the difference between life and death. You know that as head of the team, I must decide when and on whom to employ it. I... You want to tell me that there's a child who needs it just as much as I am. Let's stop wasting time. Get her in here and get started. I'm not asking you to make the decision. No, of course you're not. I'm telling you. If it came to that point, you'd make the decision. In fact, you'd already made it, hadn't you? Oh, Stephen, I... You know damn well you had. And I hardly concur. Anyway, you can't hook me up to that contraption unless I agree. And I don't. But I thought that you... Oh, Kathy, Kathy, my dear, I only took you over the hoops to make sure you knew the kind of guts it took for your husband to make this decision. And what a good man you're marrying. Now, let's get that little girl down here. And you, too, listen to me, both of you. You pull her through... Or I'll never speak to either one of you again. Is the bath ready, Kathy? Yes, Dr. Harding. Had enough time for diffusion, nurse? All set. How's your picture on the cardioscope, Dr. Mason? See for yourself. I don't like those T waves. We'd better get started. I'll make the cut down. Are they going to put me in that big tub? No, dear. We're just going to attach you to it so it can take all the poison out of your blood. How could you attach me? I'm just going to make a little cut in your arm. Right here. And put the magic tube in. Will it hurt? No. Dr. Johnson is putting something on you so you won't even feel it. I can't even feel my heart now. He won't let it stop. I won't let it stop, Petey. How long have they been down with the little girl, nurse? Only a couple of hours, Mr. Champion. Ah, long time to go. <laughs> Man never grows too old for new experiences. For the first time I know what a father goes through waiting for the birth of his first child. Huh? A new life for Dee Dee. As if she was born again. And I had a part in it. Almost as if she were 
My little girl. That's right. Close your eyes and rest. No, not to rest. To pray. How's the scope, Doctor? T-waves are almost flat. What happened? Potassium imbalance. She must have lost too much. But can we save her? After all that's happened, we'd better. Let me listen. Arrhythmia. How high do you want the potassium, five? The way the EKG looks, bring it to six. Let's see, what's the atomic weight of potassium? 39 plus. Chlorine, 35, so in a 100 liter bath, that makes it uh, eight grams, right? Go to the head of the class, you've got it. Oh. Now we wait. Why does diffusion have to be so damnably slow? You sure it was potassium? Damn well, better be. We'll have lost two patients. It's a hundred to one Stephen signed his death warrant for this child. She has got to come through. Stephen Champion has every reason for living. He's got to have a decent one for dying. <laughs> Stephen? Morning? Ah, oh, oh, that's you, Bruce. When are you going to hook me up to that infernal machine of yours? You were on it for ten hours last night. I was? Uh, I don't remember. But I, I'm afraid it didn't do what's good. The old kidneys are too far gone for that. Someday, soon, we'll make one of those breakthroughs, and you'll be able to fit me for a new set. Or one. One be enough. If a transplant were only possible. Yeah, but it isn't yet. <sighs> anyway, I'm tired of talking about me. How's the little girl? She came through with flying colors. We'll save both her kidneys. Uh, it is a nice thing. And a sad thing. What do you mean? I'm a lifesaver. Well, in actuarial figures, I am a statistician's delight because I've improved percentage figures on life expectancy in a lot of fields. But of all of them, whoever they were... I never got to know one single human being whose life my research ever saved. There's one you can meet if you want. Dee Dee. You saved her life directly. My best promise of whatever immortality I'll have. Yes. With all my heart, I want to meet so, you're Daisy. Yes, Mr. Champion. How do you feel, Daisy? Feel good, thanks. How do you? Oh, terrible, terrible. If you want to feel real good like me, you should have Dr. Johnson and Dr. Harding fix you up. Ah, that's just what I aim to do. They're a team. And a good one. The only thing is, they take an awful long time and a person gets pretty tired. Mm. Well, maybe it's time for you to go, huh? Well, I, I don't mean to be, but I am real sleepy. Yeah, come to think of it, so am I. Bye-bye, Dee Dee. Bye, Steve. Get a good, long rest. Sleep tight, Steve. Yes. Just what I'll do, Dee Dee. You can take her upstairs now, nurse. And close the door. Bruce, 
Mr. Champion. I... I know, Kathy. Steve? Sleep tight, Steve. No woman ever said that to me but that little girl. <laughs> when I never had. We've got to get you back on the kidney. Uh, wouldn't help. It doesn't matter. Let the rest of them find the breakthroughs. I'm happy. You may be going to get married, Bruce, but I beat you to it, boy. Beat me to, to what? Heading out the cigars. I finally became a father. So that's who you are. That means you are dead. You're a ghost. Oh, I can think of pleasanter terms. So let's say your guardian angel. Why don't you pull over and park in that turnaround up ahead? Why? Well, you make up your own mind about that. Just be a good girl and stop there as I tell you. All right. Yeah, that's better. Nice and quiet. Easier to think. I remember everything now. I was so sleepy, I didn't understand why I had to go and meet you. I owe you my life. You don't really owe me anything, Didi. Except that in you I borrowed a little piece of immortality as long as you lived. Of course, if you don't, I lose that. Now I have to go. No way. I... How can I go back? I... I haven't the courage. I... I need help. You don't need help except from within yourself. You see, I really am a ghost, Dee Dee. I don't exist. Except in some dim, buried subconsciousness, perhaps. I never was there. But I've been talking to you. And just talking to you... You've come to a decision. If you have, it's your own. Don't you see? The only one you've been talking to is yourself. 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 Ben, I've been out of my skull. I didn't know what to do. I was just about ready to call the police. I... Frank, Frank, just hold me. Don't say anything. Oh, I'll hold you. Don't ever worry. Oh. I'll hold you so you can never run away again. I never will. Let's go inside. Home. And start all over again. Of course, dearest. You must be terribly tired. You're worn out. No, no, darling, no. I have a new lease on life. I'm looking for a new little boy who's going to be called Stevie. I'll even settle for a girl. <laughs> we'll call her Stephanie. Come on, darling. Come, Frank. Where? You and I are going to build another piece of immortality for someone. You and I are going to have a new baby. So Stephen Champion will achieve his piece of immortality after all. For the only sure life after death is the memory of us. The memory that stays in the hearts and minds of our friends and our families and their children and their children's children. I'll be back shortly. Did Dee Dee really see 
a ghost in the car? Or was it just the evocation of a memory buried and forgotten in childhood, but still haunting the corridors of the mind? Doesn't really matter, does it? For ghosts are real. All of us carry them within us. Nor should the word ghost be feared. The most persistent of them are a heritage of our parents' love. As Steve said, a better name would be Guardian Angels. Our cast included Michael Wager, Marion Seldes, Robert Dryden, Hetty Galen, and Shelley Bruce. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I heard that somebody lifted it. Rest assured that by now, Colonel Poulos has received information from Interpol and is probably looking for you, too. Now, you will give me this sacred rope or I will kill you here and now. All right, now, hold it a second, will you? Naturally, when I kill you... The young lady cannot be allowed to exist as a witness. Ah, he's bluffing. You will place the necklace in my hands now. If, I say if, I had the necklace, I wouldn't have it on me, right? I'd have it stashed. So if you knock me off, you'll never get your hands on it. Once again, this is not a motion picture. Such a speech means nothing. And Mr. Turner, killing you would give me much pleasure. (laughs) Killing anyone is pleasurable. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and all state insurance companies. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.